I guess I want to start with uh, the topic that is on everybody's mind in Utah and around the country, uh, vaping. Vaping has been linked to more than 80 cases of serious illnesses here in Utah. We had our first vaping-related death just a few weeks ago. So what role is the Utah Poison Control Center playing in these cases? And uh, we'll shift to policy very soon. Uh, Dr. Dunn, why don't we start with you? Hello. Can you guys hear me now? Is it working? It's, it is back there. Okay, so I'll speak Talk up. Loud. I didn't know if it was going to project. Um, so here in Utah, we do have a big, um, very high burden of vaping-related illnesses that are causing lung injury, um, particularly in our young adults. Um, and it's spread throughout the state. Um, we do have one of the highest burdens in the whole country. Um, so this is something we work Outbreaks like these are something we work very collaboratively with the Poison Control Center on. Specifically for vaping, we use their expertise in toxicology to better inform things like our case definition, things we should be investigating, um, and what we should look out for in our case population. Um, we've worked closely with them on other outbreaks um, where we get a lot of uh, questions and calls from the public. Oftentimes, we'll use the Poison Control um, Call Center and their expertise to field calls from the general public when that's needed as well. Um, do you want to expand on that? I don't yeah. have much to say. Yeah, Dr. Moss, maybe what was the first call that you got? And ha like, how do you answer it when it's something that's not really on the radar yet? You know, the first call I got was, I think, a day after the reports came out of Wisconsin where someone said, have you guys heard anything about it? I think the doctor themselves hadn't heard the report. And I said, actually, just yesterday I heard about this um, from the CDC. Let's look into it some more. At that point, we were still learning a lot. We're still learning quite a bit about what's going on. Um, we're getting involved now. We're a resource for physicians who may call and are wondering about it. We can direct them to the health department, tell them what resources are out there, the recommendations that the CDC is making to doctors on what should you do to evaluate or treat these patients. And now we have some information out on our website, out on social media, that if the public is having questions about things, they can always call us. People often turn to us when they don't know where else to go because 24-7 someone is there answering the phone and we can help people you know, know what to do, tell them right now, we don't know that there's any vaping product that is safe to use and encourage people to not use that at all or having any questions about their symptoms to see their doctor. And the symptoms are quite variable, Dr. Dunn. I mean, I've heard everything from a cough, like a flu-like symptom to a stomach ache. That doesn't even seem related, but how yeah, are you absolutely. making those links? Sure, so the clinical syndrome associated with all of these cases or the vast majority is they start out with kind of um, vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, and then about a week later, go to the emergency department and are hospitalized for problems with breathing. Um, so that kind of clinical syndrome does lead, lead us to think that it is some sort of contaminant in a product um, because of that kind of acute nature of the gastrointestinal symptoms followed by the respiratory depression. Um, so that's what we've been seeing. Um, thankfully, as we're moving forward in this outbreak and clinicians are looking more for these cases, We've seen less hospitalizations because the patients are getting treated sooner and taken care of sooner. Um, but, th but those are the symptoms we've been seeing. Yeah. Let's shift to the public policy. Utah Department of Health has banned flavored e-cigarettes, and we do have one lawmaker who's, who wants to ban vaping altogether in the state of Utah. Um, Representative Elison, what's the right public policy response to something that is new and emerging? I mean, do you study it? Do you <laughs> jump right in and ban it? What do you do? So uh, this past session, I sponsored legislation that raised the legal age for both combustible tobacco and uh, vaping to 21. It hasn't gotten a lot of coverage. It took me three years to run the bill before I finally got it passed. And the first two years, I didn't include vaping. I had met with representatives from a large tobacco company, actually in Virginia, when I first thought about running the bill. And interestingly, they told me, we won't oppose uh, Tobacco 21 for traditional tobacco, leave vaping out of it. They said, we don't believe that a business model that kills our consumers is a sustainable business model. And when I heard that, I thought, did you just say that? So I, I knew politically if the tobacco companies were fighting my bill, it was going to be a harder road to, to hoe. So I excluded vaping for the first two years. 
the bill struggled to even get out of rules. And this past session, this was even before these incidents started to, to manifest themselves. There was enough evidence, particularly amongst the youth, that this was becoming a very serious problem. In fact, during this session, I had a young person that came up to testify in favor of the bill. And this one statement kind of just summarized what a big issue this is. They said, I asked my teacher, why are there toilets in the vaping room? You have to think about that for a second. Why are there toilets in the vaping room? And uh, I became better educated on the effects of you know, nicotine on the developing brain. So uh, at the urging of public health officials, Department of Health and uh, other, other groups, I included vaping this session, which I thought that may make this more difficult to get through. But we did have um, none of the major tobacco companies opposed the bill. And it is, a, it is a phase in that will raise the age to 21. So somebody who'd already started wouldn't be locked out. I thought that'd make it easier. So, so the good news is, is at least from an availability perspective, we can talk about banning flavors, but effectively for those under 21 in the very near future, those are off the table already. So I, I ran the bill at the urging of public health officials that years ago said, the number one thing you could do for public health is raise the age of tobacco to 21. I think about 95% of adult smokers started smoking before the age of 21 when their brain was especially susceptible to addiction. So that is one, I think, good policy uh, effort that we have done in the state. And serendipitously, looking back on it, uh, I, we couldn't have done it. Well, I guess we could have done it sooner, but I'm glad we did it when we, when we did last session. Senator Vickers, I'm, I'm curious what you're hearing from your constituents. What do they want you to do? Well, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, let me say that one thing I found out being majority leader in the Senate, I mean, you're, you're second in command. Well, when I pick up my phone, I see Stuart Adams. He's the Senate president. I see that. I, I know that I've got a project I'm going to have to do. And he actually made that call to me. He said uh, teen vaping. Of course, we were really looking at teen vaping at that time before the manifestation of some of the deaths and some of the things that are going on with some of the other things across the state and in Utah. And so we've really emerged ourselves in that. And we've had a number of legislators, some colleagues in the House, some colleagues in the Senate that are looking specifically about that. I've been working behind the scenes, but there's some startling things that are going on because teen vaping in particular has gone from zero to 60 just almost overnight. And you know, it's just a manifestation, you know, like Steve said, you know, about the bathroom, talking about the bathroom, there's a lot of it going on. And the drug prevention coalitions, uh, local health departments, school districts have been doing dealing with this for some time. It, it's gone from not on the radar to the number one topic that they're facing concern. And just some statistics. So as they've, they've polled students and parents, 35% of the students see no problem with vaping marijuana a couple of times a week. 65% see no problem at all with vaping, period. And that goes for parents and students. And so that we've got to do something to change that perception. That has got to come around. And then obviously with uh, some of the manifestations of some of these deaths, you know, people are clamoring to try to figure out. So from a policy perspective now as a legislature, we've got to make some choices. Number one, do we allow vape, you know, flavored vaping material to be sold in the state? You know, and that's a question. You know, there's some that say no, some that say yes. Let's assume that we say yes. Okay, so if that's the case, where are we going to allow that to be sold? You have specialty tobacco shops that are under tighter control with the local health departments. You have some general retail operations that some of them are um, playing by the rules, others are not. So, for example, their, half, their total sales of tobacco products has to be less than, is it 35%, Steve? So what they do to get around that is you, and I've got a copy of a receipt in my phone that shows a vaping product, vaping juice, $4.99. Accessories, 20 bucks. Well, the only accessory they got was a box that they put the product in. So they're using that as a tool. So you have to, and then you can, be, you can also buy those products in gas station, convenience stores. Interesting enough, University of Pennsylvania did a study that showed this change in perception of young people has primarily transpired because of what they see when they go into a service station or a convenience store. They see the signs, they see the product. I thought it would be social media. Social media is number two. That is number one. So there's some, there's some questions we have to make, ask ourselves, and what we're going to do. If we're going to 
allowed them to be sold then, and then the whole impurity issue. We ran, with, we ran into that with CBD when we were doing, had CBD products, and the impurities were going on there. We, we chose to require each one of those products to be registered with the Department of Agriculture in the state to try to make sure that the patient and the public was safe and, and feeling comfortable that if that product was registered with the state and through testing they'd proven that it said what it, it was, what it said it was, nothing more, nothing less. Kind of got, we probably have to go through the same kind of a process with the vaping issue. And so those are some questions that we've had to ask, but you know, people are concerned. I hope that they're concerned enough to change their perception about the safety of vaping. I want to get, we have a lot of health issues to talk about. So I, one last question for uh, Dr. Moss and Dr. Dunn. I'm curious about, um, you know, so much of what we heard from Dr. Temple is the Utah Poison Control Center, public health policy general, it's, it's a, uh, an investigative process. So you're still in the learning process. Talk about how you can make policy recommendations when you're sort of midstream on finding out exactly what's going on. Dr. Moss first. Yeah, that's a tough thing to do and we don't know where things are coming from or what they are at first. Um, I guess our initial recommendations are always trying to identify where things are coming from and tracking things down, which thus far has not been terribly successful of a single retailer or place or product or name, which in this case has made things really tough, uh, which is different from maybe other things in the past where we knew about laundry pods or something. Very specific product, very exactly we knew what was going on. So Don't this has been a eat them. Don't eat them. And it was an easy thing <laughs> to do. That's pretty easy. Right? That, that was a simple, uh, a simple problem and more or less simple solution of store things in an appropriate place, only use them for what they're supposed to be doing. And here people are using things that they believe are safe and that are safer than cigarettes, uh, which is true probably to some degree. Um, so making recommendations to the public is difficult, but what we've done is say, we don't know that vaping is safe. We recommend that you not do it. Probably shouldn't switch to cigarettes instead, but as best we can avoid these products that we don't know what's in there. They're not regulated, they're not tested, and you never know what you're getting. And to what extent are you sharing that information, um, Dr. Dunn, with lawmakers? Oh, regularly. I mean, especially with regards to this outbreak, um, for our public health investigation, we always give the public the evidence we have at the moment and make the best recommendation based on the evidence we have. So for this investigation, it's been obvious that the vast majority of the cases have been exposed to THC vape carts. Right now, like Dr. Moss was saying, we don't know what's in it that's causing the illness, but we do know that in order to protect yourself, don't vape THC carts. And so those are the types of recommendations we make. And as we get more evidence to allow that to become a more specific recommendation, whether it's a brand or you know, where you buy it from, then those recommendations will definitely become more specific. But we're always giving the public the most evidence we have at the moment and the recommendation based on those evidence. And we give that same information to lawmakers um, because a big part of public health, especially in something like a vaping investigation, is the policy side in order to have the biggest intervention to stop people from getting sick and dying. Uh, you mentioned CBD, or maybe it was Senator Vickers. Keep the microphone, Dr. Dunn. So let's talk about mar medical marijuana. Um, it is about to come online in Utah in March of 2020. How is this going to change public health in Utah? Um, well, so at the health department, we now have a center for medical cannabis um, that's responsible for registering um, all the patients who will have a um, condition where they're allowed to have a marijuana prescription from a physician and, and get that legally. Um, in terms of public health in general, what it does is it really puts on our radar the ability to um, track the use of medical marijuana and better understand the health implications of that and on specific conditions. So allow us to kind of better understand, you know, what benefits it may have for specific conditions. Um, it also puts on our radar the issue of black market or illicit THC as well. Um, in some states where THC has become more legal or marijuana has become more legal, they've seen a, a surge in some black market marijuana as well. And so that falls on public health to start just like this vaping investigation or a CBD investigation a year ago, um, to be able to have that capacity in-house to um, investigate those illicit contaminants that make people sick. Uh, yes, Representative Eagles. Um, I just want to point out one thing. Um, of course, the, the voters passed the medical uh, cannabis initiative, and then the legislature came back in and made some changes, uh, for which we were heavily criticized. Um, I think it is important to note that one of the changes we made is that the product had to be regulated, tested, 
and know what sources it came from. Had we not made those changes, um, it would have already been available without any quality controls. So I think there is uh, some deeper thought that has gone into some of these changes, but um, just something to point out. All right, Senator Vickers, do you want to piggyback on the, the lawmaker's role in regulating and distributing medical marijuana? Yeah, for good or bad, I've, I've been involved heavily with the, you know, that legislation. I uh, was involved with before uh, Prop 2, and then, as Steve mentioned, the, we, the legislature chose to make some choice changes in that legislation. Quite frankly, there were some things that had to be changed. There were some things that just did not fit and did not work with. But we chose, Utah as a state and as a legislature, uh, chose to go down a controlled medical path, much different than many of the other states. Uh, we more mimic you know, Connecticut, Minnesota, those states, looking at how the, their model, they use uh, cannabis pharmacies, they don't use cannabis dis dispensaries. So we use that model where pharmacists actually are involved in that, uh, the dispensing and the, the counseling and the control of that product. Uh, we have a, a more controlled uh, patient profile, you know, qualifying illnesses, those types of things. So as as we've gone down that, we've been very thoughtful, but the one thing that, is, that we've really looked at is just kind of take the perception of if it's a medicine, let's treat it like medicine, both from the regulatory side and from the medical side. And quite frankly, that's how we tried to pattern that legislation. And then also, as I've looked at other states, there's a lot of other states doing this and they're playing it a lot of different ways. But the one thing that doesn't seem to be happening, it just doesn't seem to be a lot of information coming back, data gathering and, and those types of things. I think Utah can actually lead out on that. And the University of Utah plays a very, very important role. We actually have a study going on right now that the legislature funded that's looking at pain. And it's a double blind study. We're looking forward to those results. Uh, but I think that the, the U and a lot of different of capacities up here on the Hill can help us with that because, you know, when it comes to dosing and looking at what, where it's effective, where it's not, some of the interactions, you know, I'm even myself as a pharmacist starting to look at those and there's just not as much data out there as I'd really like. So I hope through this process that we can come together as a state and as a medical community to gather that and help patients as they go forward. We know that patients can benefit. I, I will tell you this, that the perceptions are out there that with the public are not totally accurate. Everybody thinks there's going to be hundreds of thousands of patients, and they're thinking that everybody's going to qualify, and that's not the case. And that this, there's a high failure rate, too. On these medications, if you look at other states and where people are using them, there's a high failure rate. You can even, that's even documented in the FDA trials of Epidiolex and Sativex, you know, where you see a failure rate of as high as 50%. And people don't take that into consideration as well. People try it, they think, they go in and think, oh, this is going to, this is the panacea, this is going to cure. It's not, you know, cannabis is an adjunct therapy at very best. You know, it helps and assists, and it's another tool that the physician can use in treating a patient, but it, you know, it just doesn't cure things, you know, it doesn't, and so we, we need to help the public understand as we implement this and go down this medical path that this is an opportunity to help patients, but it's not that cure-all, and it's, and there are some misconceptions out there, and those need to be cleared up. Uh, Dr. Moss, is, is this going to rock your world, or do you expect a, a, a slow scaling up of calls when it comes to medical cannabis? Well, it's already started, so we already have some experience. What are, what are the questions you're getting? Uh, well, the most common thing we get is probably children getting into things that are around the house, especially edible products are the biggest trouble. We've seen our exposures and call cases about marijuana go up in the recent years, probably as we're getting surrounded by more and more states with recreational marijuana, Nevada, Colorado, the whole West Coast. Uh, coincidentally, I was in Oregon just when recreational cannabis rolled out there doing my fellowship, and we had a big influx of cases then uh, related to kids getting exposed to these, and as well as adults and people who had not, uh, who were trying cannabis again for the first time, so to speak, who had not used for decades and then used the new high potency products that are out there now, coming to emergency rooms, doctors not sure what to do. Um, children showing up to emergency rooms with confusion and stumbling around and people not knowing what's happening. So we've already seen that happen. And I think, um, you know, whatever your views are on cannabis, if there's more product available, more kids and more adults and people using it are going to have 
more exposures to them and they're gonna have more problems. And the Poison Center is always there to be a resource for that. We have good data from other states on, you know, some of the doses that happen that when people get into it that they need to seek care or go to the emergency room. We have a good profile of what adverse effects we expect if people accidentally get into things. And we can help people answer questions too about other interactions with their medication, uh, driving, things like that, that that might come up. So I think we are ready already because it's already been happening. And how much of a change will there be when things go live? Uh, I am hopeful that the regulation and packaging and dosing and things will really help us have a better handle on things where we saw a lot of the unregulated market in Oregon um, gave us some more trouble, more the DIY things at home rather than things that people got from official sources. Please, Senator. Dr. Moss, he mentioned, you know, better control, labeling, and those kind of things. In the in the legislation, the difference between Utah and some other states is that we've only allowed it in certain medicinal dosage forms, and that will be uh, something that the doctor would feel more comfortable with in prescribing and, and allowing the patient to have something that's a little bit easier to dose, and also, uh, hopefully, you know, turn off some of that black market. But you know, unfortunately. I'm sure that they're going to try to find ways to get around that. But that is one precaution we put in place in the legislation. Great. I'm sorry to just skip over. A whole, we're going to spend an hour on each one of these, but time is fleeting. I would like to get to suicide because Utah does have higher than the national uh, rate for suicides. An average of 627 Utahns die from suicide each year. 4,500 Utahns attempt suicide each year. And Representative Ellison, um, you secured uh, $2 million for a campaign to prevent suicides. How, how is, how's it going and how are you using that money? Will it work? Uh, yes, thank you. So we know that um, the increase in the opioid epidemic is tied uh, to a degree with our, our suicide epidemic. Uh, I was, I couldn't help but read the sign over here uh, from the Poison Control Center. It says, skip the internet, pick up the phone, and call uh, the Poison Control Center. Uh, kind of old fashioned, but uh, still works. And um, we uh, want people to be aware of resources like the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline that is hosted here at the University of Utah. The University Neuropsychiatric Institute hosts that. Interestingly, uh, I was talking to uh, Barbara Cr Crouch before we started, and I think there is mentioned they're getting about 40,000 calls uh, to the Poison Control Center a year. The calls to the the crisis, unique crisis center, are in that same neighborhood. Just last month alone, we had 3,500 students in the month of September reach out through the Safe UT app for crisis counseling and uh, school safety tips, which the number one tip was suicide. Um, so the, the Safe UT app is more of an online option for children, uh, well, all the way through uh, college students. And then, of course, the National Lifeline is a resource available for the entire state. So the $2 million was a million provided by the legislature, matched by private sources, a pub public-private partnership. We raised the money extremely quickly. The goal is to get messages like we have out for the Poison Control Center uh, relating to the Suicide Prevention Lifeline to let people know it's okay to reach out and call something a lot of people don't know about. Actually, I'm gonna quick show of hands. Who knows what the uni warm line is? Okay, about 2% of people, okay. So the warm line is the step below the crisis line where somebody who's maybe moving towards having a crisis, having a difficult episode in their lives, they need someone to talk to, they can call the uni warm line. Calls there have been going up dramatically. And just like the, uh, the crisis uh, call center diverts people from the emergency room, you know, the poison control does the same thing. These are very critical public investments. The average call to the poison control center or the crisis lifeline are in the, probably the, the very low double digits. We know that an emergency room visit is going to be in the, the four digit range. So from a public health perspective, the services offered through the U, both through the poison control and through the crisis line are life-saving uh, resources for our citizens. And um, the, the two million dollars was is simply for public awareness messaging. Um, we recently approached uh, Steve Young, the quarterback. Uh, you may have heard of him, and he's agreed. He he actually recorded a fabulous PSA for us that's going to be launching soon. 
encouraging people to call the crisis line. Uh, this is a little unknown statistic or less, lesser known statistic. Of the 47,000 suicides in America, 70% were one particular demographic. I'll just think for a second, what would that demographic be? Well, it's Caucasian males. In Utah, that number is above 80%. And uh, demographic I fall into, reticent to often ask for help. And so the goal through this funding is to encourage uh, help-seeking behaviors and that it's really it's tough guys that reach out and ask for help and there's nothing wrong in doing that. Thank you. We've got just two minutes. Sadly, I really want to spend a lot of time on opioids. You mentioned opioids. Um, Dr. Dunn, maybe um, talk about the alarming statistic that five Utahns die from opioid overdose every week. Um, and how is the Department of Health combating that? Um, and maybe, Dr. Moss, you can end up with the Poison Control Center's role in this, too. Sure. So the opioid, opioid epidemic has, has not gone away. That's still very much a priority in public health in Utah and nationally. Um, we are starting to see a slow decrease in our opioid deaths due to prescriptions. Um, with that, though, we are seeing an increase in a death due to heroin. However, in Utah, we still, the vast majority of our opioid overdoses are pills, um, which is different than the East Coast, which has already kind of switched to vast majority of deaths doing, being due to heroin and illicit drugs. We're still very much a pill state, and so at the Department of Health, we coordinate with tons of partners. I mean, the opioid epidemic is not going to be solved just by public health. We work with human services, legislators, poison control, clinicians, mental health providers, um, patient advocates. I mean, you name it, we, we've got them at the table. Um, at the Department of Health, we own distribution of naloxone, so making sure that those who are at risk for overdose or have family members or friends who are at risk for overdose have naloxone available and know how to use it. And we also work really closely with providers on um, safe prescribing of opioids and working to taper off, taper down those patients who may be addicted to opioids off of the opioids or to a lower dose where they won't be as high of risk um, for overdose. So, Dr. Motz, uh, while you're answering uh, the role that the Utah Poison Control Center plays in, in the opioid prevention epidemic, I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, Barbara Crouch to come up. Um, she's executive, executive director of the Utah Poison Control Center. Dr. Motz. Well, the Poison Center is doing a few different things. One is our just day-to-day -day that we're always there to take phone calls from people who may accidentally get into opioids at home of kids, someone taking an accidental extra dose, doctors in the hospital that are taking care of patients who have overdosed as our you know, bread and butter everyday sort of thing. On the public health piece of it, we have some of our data collection. Dr. Temple talked about that, the importance of not just taking the phone calls, but recording the data and then sharing that with our public health partners. So we share data on where is naloxone being used, you know, which counties is this coming from, what are the overdoses that are happening with what sort of products that people are taking and then um, needing naloxone. And then just recently, a, a team of us at the Poison Center put together a training for naloxone use that the public and law enforcement, anyone else can access because everyone can get naloxone at local pharmacies and lots of other um, public organizations, but they may not be quite sure how to use it and so now we have training out there that anyone can figure out which product they have and kind of see a hands-on video of what would I actually do if I need to use this on a loved one. That's great. Uh, Dr. Crouch is generously giving you a couple of minutes for questions. So I'll probably have a minute, two minutes. Anyone have a question? Wait for the mic, please. I have a question about uh, diagnoses to get marijuana. I'm wondering, are there any mental, are there any mental health diagnoses? I suspect that'd be one area in which it might be abused, or any other areas. Senator Vickers. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, PTSD under certain circumstances and diagnosis and, and validation uh, certainly can. Uh, I know some people would like a broad term, broader term like anxiety. The trouble with that is it's it's almost too broad. And as you looked at other states, you know that's you know. So we try to allow for some some diagnosis within that framework, but uh, still have some control on that. There'll be a lot of effort, uh, right? You know, even we haven't even implemented the law yet, and people are clamoring to change that list. Um, my perception is, look, let's let the list get out there and let's start dealing with it. Take some a hard look at it before we start making changes to it. So, another question. 
Okay, go for it. Uh, can you tell us about the uh, problems with fentanyl overdose? Uh, I was listening to the radio this morning, and there was uh, uh, apparently there are problems in China. They're shipping it over in the mail, and people are using it, and a lot of people are dying from it. Uh, Dr. Dunn, you want to take that one? Um, so fentanyl is definitely an issue nationally and in Utah. Um, we're not seeing it as pervasive in Utah as some other states are, but it's something we're constantly on the lookout for and working with law enforcement in, on their drug seizures so we kind of can anticipate what's coming. Um, fentanyl is, someone who takes fentanyl is at a far higher risk of overdosing than another opioid, um, and we are seeing it be put into drugs that users might not think that there's fentanyl in it, such as meth, um, some marijuana products, et cetera. Um, so it's something we're on the lookout for, but thankfully we haven't seen it kind of as pervasive, well, unless Dr. Moss is gonna contradict me on that, okay, no. <laughs> at the public health side. Um, Utah's actually had their first car front fentanyl death, which is an elephant tranquilizer, which is, I don't know, roughly a thousand times more powerful than fentanyl. So ha having resources such as the Poison Control Center can always stay ahead of these you know, public health outbreaks is, is, is a great resource, but it's scary how quickly things keep continue to um, come forward and uh, are so much more potent. Dr. Moss, no? I can add one. Okay. One quick thing since you give me the mic, but I'd say the other thing to add is uh, the other time where this has popped up is people buying counterfeit oxycodone or Xanax or other pills on the street that not just buying heroin and injecting, but people who might be trying to get pills off the street uh, that they weren't able to obtain in another way that's popped up occasionally, though we are fortunate in Utah that we are not seeing it nearly to the degree that the Midwest and the Northeast. Dr. Crouch, the floor is yours. I want to say thank you to everyone for um, being part of this uh, forum in, in celebration of our 65th anniversary at the Utah Poison Control Center. I want to thank um, everyone for making the forum po uh, possible and for Molly Wheeler and the Hinckley Institute for um, hosting us. Um, to Jennifer Napier Pierce, who did a phenomenal job at moderating today's program. To Dr. Temple for sharing his wisdom and insight about the evolution of the Poison Control Center and the important role that Utah really has played in shaping poison centers nationwide. And to our distinguished panel members, Senators Vickers, Representative Elison, Drs. Dunn and Moss, uh, for helping us to showcase the intersection of public policy, public health, and the Poison Center. Um, and I couldn't be really prouder of the Utah Poison Control Center for all it's accomplished the last 65 years. I wasn't there all that 65 years. Um, but it really wouldn't have been possible except for the tremendous um, talented um, staff and our ardent supporters. Um, so thank you again for being a part of this great celebration.